harder for him to come to terms with or observe certain things. Uh, the things I mentioned so far are, are things that I would suggest impel him toward trying to come to, to notice, to observe, to find a way to write. Uh, the others, I think, are, uh, the, the next thing I'm going to mention I think, are things that I think made him unwilling to notice certain things or to record them, things that Teve, for instance, recorded. And one has to, I mean, there's certain, certain silences. Uh, one is the silence that Watley points out about the Tupi myths uh, in the chapter on religion. Uh, we have a scoffing reference to uh, ancestral spirits who are in the Maracas that the um, Kara'i, that the shamans bring uh, and that are then planted in the ground and food is left for them. And those are ancestral spirits for Khan. The same ancestral spirits who are the ones that are uh, uh, spirits or ancestral spirits whose voices we hear at the beginning of that ceremony that scares him so much. Remember that first he hears the hey, hey sound and he's terrified. Uh, women, because these are witches, and, uh, and then uh, he hears again about the spirits because they're in the Malachis. Um He doesn't, move, that's all he says, and he doesn't move to these myths that are actually documentable elsewhere in the Teve, in his two months there slurps right up and, and anecdotally loves to, to tell. There's kind of reluctance uh, there uh, that was interesting on the storytelling. Uh, uh, not like these stories. There is, uh, and I'll come back to comment on, on this in a moment. He, in his dubiousness about whether they have any religion at all, he says, well, they don't really have a place where they practice it. They don't have a liturgy. He's just saying they don't have a liturgy. They don't have a, um, and that makes it quite hard for him to think that they really have a religion. Uh, he sort of, you know, they so, they have these three ideas that uh, they believe in the devil, and that he proves them. They believe in resurrection, and they uh, and they believe in the body, and they believe in the immortality of the soul. So he says, well, in these three ways, Cicero's claim, and you find that referred to over and over again in Jesuits. Or, uh, that's quoted over again, that somehow all people have some idea of God. In these three ways, we sort of have religion here, but we don't really have an idea of God, and we don't really have what you can call religion, I think it's phrases, because they don't have, um, uh, they don't really have, not only are they utterly ignorant of the soul of true God, uh, they don't, what is more in contrast to the custom of all the ancient pagans who had many gods, as do the idolaters of today, even in these Peru, a uh, land adjacent to theirs, uh, who sacrificed to the sun and moon, they neither confessed or worship any gods, either of heaven or earth. Consequently, having no rites, nor any designated place of assembly for ho holding any ordinary service, they do not pray by any religious form to anything whatsoever, either in public or in private. He just can't imagine. It's trouble imagining how a religion could, uh, could work. Uh, well, let me... Uh, let me make a few comments about what he's coming to. He's coming to this with uh, a very strong sense, uh, reform sense, of a new liturgy, uh, of the, the Lord's Supper, uh, and of, of a, a sense that the community, that a community must be present uh, uh, for weekly worship. There must be a community action, not that you don't have the privates of the intimate communication, the biblical Bible reading side of Protestant, and we have that too, but you have a especially for foreign religion, a very strong sense of uh, religion, of the new liturgy, which has just been uh, established of, uh, for both the Lord's Supper and the singing of the Psalms. Uh, you have a, a simultaneously a very strong attack, and this is referred to, I think, by Watley, of Protestantism on ghosts, on purgatory, uh, on family, on messages from families. Uh, uh, all of which I think would make him, I mean, I, what I'm suggesting is that his interest in liturgy uh, of, of, a, of a Protestant kind, uh, the Protestant belief, the Protestant suspicion of Catholic drama, that's all the mass is, it's just a book, it's just it's just deception. It's just like a Morris dance, which is a, a phrase they use quite, quite often. Uh, it's just a bunch of um, dramatic lies. Uh, and the 
uh, and the, there's also uh, a very great hostility in the Protestant sensibility to, to sermons that tell stories, not storytelling sermons that they thought were just cheap Franciscan ways of interesting, interesting their uh, their listeners. They were, just to get them along. They didn't like that. They didn't like story. They were suspicious of excessive storytelling. They took me down the same slightly dangerous path. And there are not a lot of stories. I mean, we could talk about stories, but there's not a lot of anecdotes. There are not a huge numbers of stories told. He'll sometimes use anecdotes. This happened to me. But it's not It's not loaded with stories. It's constant. So there's a lot of description. And uh, in fact, it would be interesting to stop at the places where he tells the story, as the story when he first got there and uh, all people were going to kill him. Uh, and the story uh, uh, in which he got to, to a lot of trouble when he killed the, the chicken in the village. Remember that? And, and one of the little French boys said, well, he wants some poetry. He kept, and the duck killed the duck. And then it turns out that the man who was duck belonged to his extraordinary set. Uh, what, I'm, so what I'm trying to suggest is that this is there's other reasons. There's probably a Protestant sense really working against his not rec being very unsympathetic to family ghosts and miraculous things, and thinking that you can't have religion if you don't have liturgy. Um, uh, and I, I'm going to make one other leap here, uh, which is not in the text, but it goes back to what I was saying about uh, the, the cyclicity, the inner quality of that system of of vengeance, unending vengeance, which works because it constantly cycles back upon itself. I mean, works for them. That is, they don't mind the unending vengeance, the, the, the tupi, uh, because they have these periodic feasts and then it, it cycles. But it, what seems to us impossible, that there are no truces, that there are no pardons, that, uh, that, that, that there's no linear vector. If you have pardons and truces, you have a history and a story that moves linearly, and here you have a story that is just constantly cycling back. Well, let me just say, I'm making a leap here, but um, it's a leap that I think, in terms of sensibility, works. Protestantism is extremely transcendent as a religion. Like, it is really very, it, it is, it's very, very transcendent. It's very non, and it has an extremely powerful history behind to it, 16th century uh, uh, Protestantism. It's, uh, and uh, it, it, uh, would just be, I mean, this is just something that runs against, um, and, and it would be interesting actually to see whether the studies of, by Maitreau and, and Lady Strauss, of, uh, especially Maitreau of Tupi Religion and, and the new book that I haven't read that is mentioned here in the footnotes, actually try to make some connection between the simplicity of the lifestyle of the Tupis and, and their religious practice. See, I mean, to see if there's a connection between eminence here and some kind of simplicity. But at any rate, all the point I'm trying to make is that, that the, 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 the positive transcendent sensibility with this very powerful time vector, Calvin says, in talking about gift giving, he says, uh, we cannot, he's very opposed to the, the mass because it suggests we're giving a gift back to God. How could we do such a thing? You cannot, you cannot give anything to God at all. And he suggests that that's what the Catholics are doing. The Catholics have said, well, we're not giving gifts back to God. But he says that's what the sacrifice of the Mass is. He says the only way the gifts work is through time. We give, we give to the future. You follow, you follow me here? So I'm suggesting that there is a sort of profound break here uh, that would make, that would sort of act as, as uh, even though there are so many things he enjoyed and delighted about these people, or, or he can use them to criticize Europe. Um, I'll, um, gosh, I'm going on All right, let me uh, say one other thing. Uh, uh, the, the, with the, two, the last thing I wanted to mention, and then I'll say about uh, the The last thing I wanted to say were moments in the text that seemed to me real, where, where he is uh, letting things go or enjoying them that don't just seem to generate any guilt in him at all but are just cutting across the grain of what I know he'd come from and what he goes back to, and what he's living in and as he writes. And one is uh, the delight of the music. Because Calvin, uh, uh, that Geneva had one set of 
one, one really important set of music, and it was the music set to the Psalms. But Calvin uh, and, and his supporters had prevented there being harmony in any of the, of the music to the Psalms because people might like the music too much and be deflected from, and this, uh, from uh, the Lord. And of course, dancing is one of the main things that you're called before the consistory for in Protestant Geneva. Dancing is bad. You're not supposed to dance. You're supposed to use your life for work and be active in it. Get your, all your exercise for working. You know. So uh, when he approves all of the exercise that comes from running and hunting and women's doing the agriculture, so that's, that's fine. That fits into Calvin's Geneva. That's the work ethic. But when he really is just delighted and entranced by the dance and the color, you know, the Genevans wore black. Of course, uh, uh, I mean, sober clothes was the name of the game, and you could tell a Protestant because they started wearing black. If you were a rich Protestant, to be sure, it was the finest of velvet, black velvet, or the finest of black silk, but they wore black. So that you see, when he, that delight is a kind of, what we do, uh, a break, is a kind of, it has to be a special privileged place in his life which he can write about and delight in. But, uh, and he has no, he has no, I guess because it, he sort of thought of it, it, it turned out it wasn't gonna be a settlement. If it had been a settlement, maybe that was it. it was just, he was just lucky. He couldn't enjoy it because he was lucky. That's really right. He was lucky that, that Bill Gagnon betrayed him. Because if <laughs> Bill Gagnon had not betrayed him, he would have had to stay there and put into effect the, the entire, try vainly, perhaps, to put into effect the entire Protestant apparatus of the consistory and the discipline. And can you imagine? And he wouldn't have been able to go back and write about it. <laughs> so, all right. I would just say a little bit about uh, uh, another wondrous person. I mean, I really, I really think that uh, even in anticipation of hearing what you think and knowing that we can do a complete, you know, European number on this man, that Delary, we're in a different world with Delary from the Cartier text. I mean, a much more likable person. And, and a, you know, just, so now I'm moving to another person who is just, just wonderful, uh, and I knew, and this actually still very much. Uh, and I just wanted to say a little bit about him. I know some of you have read him. Um, he was a Savoyard. He was born in in uh, uh, the mountains, you know, right on the borders. He's another border person <laughs> of, uh, of France in uh, Chambéry, into a Catholic family. Uh, and his he uh, was quite. He was young. He was born in 25, but he was enough old enough as a teenager during the occupation to do some running around for the resistance in the in the Savoy mountains, mountain area. Uh, after the war, he went to, to, to university in Lyon and was already interested in religion and spirituality. Uh, I'm reading, actually, uh, a biography left of him by Luce Giard, who was his spiritual companion uh, at the end of his life. And oddly, she's left out some of the things that I think in this short biography that she has told me and that he told me, but that I think are pretty interesting. His decision to become a Jesuit was in the way from a trip to, Ch to China. I think I got that right. I mean, some he was very, very interested in, in post-World War II China. And something about that, maybe a spirituality or something, he became a Jesuit. And he was a Jesuit uh, to the end of his life. But what a life. I'm going to come back to his writings in just a moment. But I just want to tell you a few the high points in his life. This. Uh, and he did, he, he you know, went through the entire Jesuit training program with a, a dissertation on, uh, on a very interesting early Jesuit who traveled throughout, uh, who traveled throughout Europe, his, his travel diary, uh, uh, one of the earliest of the Jesuits in the first generation of Loyola. Uh, his wonderful, wonderful, wonderful text. And he did this in addition and an introduction to this. Is he, so, but we're on travel already. Uh, uh, but in terms of his life, he not only taught, Jesuit places and so forth. But he traveled widely. He was deeply engaged in, in French political life. He went to South America, to Brazil, and was connected with the liberation theology people in South America. Uh, in 1968, he was one of very active in the, with the students. Uh, and in a way that I sort of, 
kind of keep wanting to defend him, to forward, forward him, uh, as opposed to Foucault. <laughs> I, who I also knew and respect, and but I think that De Certeau really deserves as much, uh, deserves the, the kind of reputation that Foucault had, uh, and as increasingly he is, I think, even more and more becoming uh, centrally rethought and, and uh, his importance. At any rate, he was quite remarkable in, in 68, uh, working with, with the students. So that was one vector. Quite early he became interested in psychoanalysis and had an analysis and worked with Lacan. And there is a psychoanalytic theme that, that runs through through everything. Um, he was uh, a, a, a person of extraordinary generosity and breadth. Uh, I mean, obviously, we'll, we'll see this his interest in, in others in his writing. But just to add a note, I mean, he had multiple friends, and this this woman who was his spiritual companion uh, and, and intellectual partner, Luciar, was of Jewish background. Uh, it's just a person of great openness. Uh, he died a Jesuit uh, and of cancer uh, much too early and uh, was buried at the Jesuit uh, Saint Eustache, I think. Is that the church? Is that right? That, yeah, so I guess the Saint Eustache is the Jesuit church in Paris. Uh, with an overflow uh, crowd of 2,000 outside, and it was, I couldn't go, but uh, what he, and I heard all about it, but he had scripted his own funeral, which included uh, Edith Piaf's song, No, Je Ne Regrette Rien. <laughs> and the Jesuits had to let it happen <laughs> because he was a Jesuit to the end. And uh, uh, I, uh, so this is an extraordinary life, I think. It's just, uh, and the very great openness and experimentation. Now, uh, just a few big comments about his, his, his themes of his writing. Uh, without in any order, there's an uh, increasing number of things on him, and there's a book coming out this fall, a new book on him. Uh, he liked, um, well, he liked uh, practices. Uh, he wrote a wonderful book on the everyday, and uh, he didn't he didn't do what Foucault did and have a big uh, theory of history and stages. It, it, I think that would have been impossible. Although we worked with ideas of modernity, but he he always would find cracks in something. He was always. Uh, and, and just having a nice, neat theory is just not the way he worked. He was not, though he was philosophically trained, he would never have wanted uh, neat stage theory. He, he, he was interested more in, in, in characterizing periods um, and, and, and suggesting ways of doing things and things that one should explore. And he, his book on the everyday, the you know, Kukikia and, and the hot Practices of Everyday Life was an example of this. Uh, Lucy R. says in her one of her appreciative essays about him that uh, she calls it alterities, and I, that might be a way to sum up, except the word wasn't so overused as it is now when he started doing this. Um, he not, not long after he worked on Pierre Favre, the Jesuit boy at travel account, he turned to the devils, he turned to the possessed of Loudon, and uh, including uh, uh, the woman. Uh, Jean, who was head of that convent, uh, who was full of uh, strange ideas about herself, had a false pregnancy and so on. Uh, and Serin, uh, who was the spiritual director of this woman at the, at the convent of Loudon. And it, he would take people who were really way out. <laughs> uh, Serin, who was one of his, uh, he's got trouble for heresy every time. Uh, and uh, uh, this woman, Jean's last name, who uh, was, no one would really want to touch ordinarily in the field he was in. And he would take these people and treat them with extraordinary seriousness. He's done this book on the Fable Mystique, is wonderful. One of the great studies of 17th century mysticism, uh, which he treats textually and connects it with poetry and science in the 17th century. And then, of course, the Amerindians, which is what attracted Jean de la Rive and some of the other. Uh, other writers. Uh, 
he was deeply interested in language and specifically the question of the vernaculars and the multiple vernaculars in France and collaborated with some younger scholars uh, on uh, the French revolutionary effort finally to stamp out, to, make, to, to, to put a finish to that whole uh, effort of the monarchy, the old regime monarchy, uh, to have really French be the language. Now they in fact didn't stamp it out, they never stamped things out, but uh, he wrote a book about uh, Abbé Grégoire and the interest in, in language. Uh, he uh, is, he said so well, I guess, if I were to say another thing about him rather than saying alterity, I would say that he liked to make things both strange and familiar at the same time. Uh, everything he wrote had that, he would start off making it strange and would sort of find ways that it could become familiar. And I think just in the text that you read, you know, you start off with the polarity between written time, identity, and conscience on one hand, and oral space, the other, and the unconscious on the other. And then the, the strategy um, is both to show the polarity and then by turning the circle round and that show that in fact uh, it isn't just here and there uh, and here uh, all, all the European story and, and there all the non-alterity story, but you turn the circle around as he does in that, in that uh, uh, diagram and it's divided another way and in some ways they are more like the literary text us. And that's sort of what I think he, he does. There's no way he gets you started with it and he turns it around. Uh, and, uh, and I think the, the other thing that, that he does in his work is, is what he suggests here, uh, shows how the neat polarities are upset and here's where the psychoanalysis comes in by design. And that's in all of his work, that is you have the, uh, the making of the strange, the showing that, the, the ma making the strange familiar, uh, uh, and then, in, then something, of, eros will come in, something of that kind will come in. Uh, and introduce an upset. Uh, so that those are just some comments about about. But I have whole bibliographies of his of his, of his writing, but it's neither here nor there for our discussion. I think the only uh, comment I wanted to uh, make, and I think if he were alive today, he would maybe agree with this, uh, is that uh, the. Uh, in, in discussing desire and the festive, the Tupi festive as opposed to the European work, he forgot about gender. It, Michel Deserto just simply never worked on that topic, as far as I know. Uh, and if, I think if we come back to the text, and maybe you really want us to comment on it, uh, and plug the women in, you'll see that it isn't that, uh, not that the women aren't relative well, desire in the text, but the women are also in the text in other way, in the Delaney text, uh, to represent work, uh, so that it isn't all just the festivity and, and uh, sitting around decorating yourself with feathers. Uh, the women are in there, uh, and the men, in fact, are women too. So it's a male expertise for sure, but there's certainly a women's work, and there are other ways in which the women figure in, in the text that he doesn't uh, as, as setting setting off a sphere that is not a male sphere, but he doesn't discuss. But at any rate, uh, that's just a comment on, on, on his, the limits to his idea of, of uh, how desire uh, and festivity operates uh, in the various texts. Well, I've talked to him, partly because I care so much about this subject longer than I have planned to. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to turn off the flow and uh, hear some comments from those of those of you who read this and uh, yes, that's the Alberta. Wouldn't be a really fascinating but for everyone to me that's the big discovery in this course. Yeah. Just well that's this is just a wonderful text, yeah. What I found really fascinating. Well there's two things. One is that his awareness of different native nations in the nineteenth century with someone like the BL is of Aboriginal descent and he would first to native people as an insulvage and then refer to them as the nationality and uh, he's very much aware of who is identified with the Portuguese and the French and the French different groups. But uh, what I found really fascinating in terms of the course is the construction of the other at the beginning. Yeah. Because oh. he's fleeing France and he escaped persecution by the Catholic who says, but then he had the Catholics and the Protestants and the Portuguese are there and the Spaniards in the middle of the ocean. Suddenly all the French are one again. 
the Catholics and the, the Protestants become one, become French. And when he talks about the Portuguese playing in Brazil, he speaks as, as a French person. That's right. And then you have these divisions. Then he's Protestant, excluding the Catholics. So the other keeps shifting. And the South keeps shifting because the South sometimes they become the French people, and then that's not. And then you have the European versus the, the natives. And then you have the native society with the Portuguese and the Spaniards versus the native society with the French. It, it gets to be really complicated who the South is yeah. and who the other is. Do, do you ever sense him as a tupi? Do you think you ever feel he goes out? I, I, I really think I have a very special invasion of Catholics, you know, the way. Yeah. And the way, to me, the way he reads at the tupis is basically he's always looking at, at Europe. It's a very way. Sometimes I wonder what he actually in Brazil, because yeah. it's a way of getting at the Catholics. Yes. So I wonder what he's actually seeing there, if this is a way of showing how cannibalistic the Catholics are. So perhaps it says more about him than it says about the people that he sees in Brazil. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I'm not quite sure. I think it'd be very interesting to see someone who is quite familiar with the culture to read, maybe. Right. And to say how he read or misread mm -hmm. the native culture. Mm -hmm. so, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, there's something that might be a bit of a people who was um, captured by Tupanamba. And I think it's the same year that um, Tevay publishes. It's 1558 that Hans Schwaben publishes an account captured uh, by the Tupanamba. And uh, he's, he's obviously not um, the same class as Levy. You can tell his writing style is much more brutal. And I think that might be an interesting contrast in terms of the, the kind of tropes he would use. Actually, it was Marburg, 1557, was the first, the first edition. Yeah, so it's the same time. Yeah, he was, he lived among, uh, among the, quote, the tribes of eastern Brazil from 1547 to 1555. It would be very, very interesting. And there is some convergence, actually. And, and uh, I was wondering, yeah. with the last, well, with all those um, chapters where he talks about different, the common fish and the manner of fishing, how he breaks that up, that's very much what Schaden does. Uh -huh. He has sort of a narrative account, but then he has this appendix at the back where he just goes through chapters. So I think uh -huh. some of the form of this might be more from that. From, from that, yeah, yeah. Could be. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's, I mean, we begin, we begin, it's certainly different from the Cartier where you had much more travel and then the, the topical things were just sandwiched into the middle in a, in a brief section and here we've got, uh, uh, they're very much expanded. Uh, any other, any other? I'm like, like everything I want to <laughs> you know, I was so disappointed. I remember I was, yeah. you know, I read the Cartier, and I was so disappointed by all that, and I didn't trust him. And Eva, it was just the opposite. I just went to the Brazil Tech, I just went to his story, and I just liked what he was saying. I had a lot of sympathy for him, the way he was looking at the other one. And then he looked at it. And also, the big difference, I think, it's, it's really, like, like several great books, it's so appropriate, because it's really a lot of shell struggle. He remembers. This is something he writes 20 years after. Can't he write on the spot? Yes. Political reasons, and it's very different. I find that different. He has a manuscript with a strange story to it, tw twice written and lost, and then he finds the original one. He but he knows. Yes. But he writes it. And then he writes the Remember. first version is 1562-63 from from the notes, and then. What do you remember? You can't tell. Right. It. But it is. It is. It's a. It's a worked over. It is. And and here's. Uh, yes. Just on that, I thought that was really curious that the first version gets lost, he writes another one, he loses the second, and this is actually the first one, as though there's some kind of more original. I was wondering, you know, just the whole reason why that's in there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Just the whole concern with authenticity mm -hmm. and getting the sort of authorial feeling to it by emphasizing the manuscript and the painting. Yeah. And the, all kinds of the whole idea of purity of writing and how writing travels through time and in a way corrects any memory faults or oral accounts so that he has a way is another way of saying his own account that he's found and takes on a kind of sacred room of the story um, and so that it ties into those themes about oral and written that Sartell, Sartell, and 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 Sartell,
Uh-huh. He's constantly saying, and his, his claim on accuracy, you have to see it to be accurate and write it accurately, uh, uh, would, would uh, be part of that. I mean, that would be part of that same claim. But this is uh, uh, believability. He does also, sometimes, when he doesn't know something, but sometimes I don't really know. I mean, there's several points in which he, he just, I leave it up to the reader, I don't really know about this, which also furthers the argument of, you can believe me, and, you know, when, when, I, when I know it, I say it, <laughs> when I don't know. When he's comparing television with 